Hey, before we start today's episode, would you mind going on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast and giving it a five-star rating? I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. And one morning, it was just five days before Christmas, Mm -hmm. we woke up and his thigh was swollen about twice its normal size. Really? And we uh, immediately made an appointment with the doctor and went in and they did a bunch of tests. And the tests came back that he had a lymphoma. Now, we didn't know what that word meant. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. Today, I am excited to introduce to you an amazing woman who's become almost a second mother to me. She's actually my mother-in-law, and I thought this would be fun to do since we just had Mother's Day, and so happy Mother's Day to all of you who mother out there. She has an incredible story to share. She grew up in Samoa, Germany, and Oregon, and has since lived in Iowa, Utah, and California. Her first husband, Dennis, was diagnosed with stage 4 Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was 25 years old and died soon thereafter when their only son was only 8 months old. She learned many lessons as a young widow that she's going to share with us today. She remarried, and now she and her husband, Richard, have a Brady Bunch family of 8 children and 32 grandchildren. She was a special education teacher for 21 years, and she and her husband, Richard, recently returned from a mission in Hungary where they served for their church. They now keep themselves busy traveling, helping refugees, and getting together with their large family. I am pleased to introduce Judy Cromar. Judy, are you ready to share your story of hope? Yes. Awesome. So... You were very young in a marriage, and why don't you build that background for us, of set the stage of this story, of where you were, what you were doing, and how circumstances suddenly changed. We were very young. We were just two years into our marriage. <clears throat> I was 23, and my husband was 25. Mm -hmm. And we were living in the Midwest, in Sioux City, Iowa. And um, my husband was a church um, supervisor over instruction. Mm -hmm. And one morning, it was just five days before Christmas, Mm -hmm. we woke up and his thigh was swollen, about twice its normal size. Really? And we uh, immediately made an appointment with the doctor and went in and they did a bunch of tests. And the tests came back that he had a lymphoma. Now, we didn't know what that word meant. I I probably wouldn't have either. (laughs) Yeah. So they seemed very grave about it. And suggested that they told us that they really didn't have the resource to specify what kind of a lymphoma. And they suggested that we go to back to Salt Lake Mm -hmm. and um, finish getting diagnosed and start treatment there and then come back. Mm -hmm. Because they had a better hospital there. Better hospital. And they mentioned, go back where you can have some family support. Okay. So... We did. We knew that it was serious, but we still had no idea what that meant. And they didn't have Google back then. So nope. Couldn't look nope. It up. <laughs> and so, so we went, and then um, there was that meeting with a hematologist who um, told us that he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which was cancer. 
And that was the first that he re we realized that he had cancer. And they also told us that he was in stage 4B. So, and we also didn't know what that meant. So why don't you explain what that means, just so that people... It's the, last, it's the last stage of cancer. Oh, it is. Before death. And B is when it's active, whereas A, you might be in a remission or it might not be as active. Okay. So 4B is as bad as it can get. But still, we were really young. Our question, of course, were, was uh, what were his chances mm -hmm. for survival? And they actually said 50%. Really? Looking back now, I, I wonder about that. <laughs> But, um, and that seemed really grave, of course. Um, and we were devastated. We just, uh, about six months before, had our first baby boy mm -hmm. and had graduated from college and first job and had everything before us mm -hmm. and it was really really frightening we stayed and got um, they got him started on a treatment program and then we did go back to Sioux City and he commuted to Omaha an hour away to continue with treatments but in fact um, nothing worked uh, radiation and chemotherapy nothing arrested the cancer um, in its spread. Ugh. And it was only, you know, five months later than when he died. Wow. So very fast. Very fast. Um, and during that time, after they'd used, after they'd tried all the conventional treatments, then they tried exploratory um, treatments and it was just um, it it uh, everyday symptoms were worse oh. there was no rest in that period at all yeah. so what was the hardest thing for you was it watching him suffer or was it an internal battle with with everything that was happening, your grief or or a combination of the two? Well, it was terrible watching them suffer. The side effects <laughs> of the treatments that they did were horrific. But um, one of the most difficult parts of it was that being Christian, we had prayed and others had prayed. Mm-hmm. And I just held on to that scripture that if I had faith, nothing wavering, mm -hmm. that those prayers would be answered. Mm -hmm. And so through the whole process, I, I would not entertain at all the idea that he was literally dying. And I can remember one day um, when he had wasted away so much and he saw his image in the mirror and he said, I just don't know how I could ever get my health back. And I said, you're not doubting, are you, that this miracle is going to happen? Mm -hmm. And he quickly said, no, he wasn't doubting, but that he just couldn't see how physically he could get back to health. So I wouldn't even allow that conversation to happen between us. Mm. And I regretted that um, years later, that we weren't able to talk about the experience that he was having. having. He wasn't able to talk about it, and I wasn't able to talk about what I was feeling because I just felt that I had to be so focused that this miracle was going to happen mm -hmm. and that he was going to be healed. And I kept that up 
right to the very end. And in fact, his family and I had some trouble about it. Yeah. Because they finally approached me and said, you're the only thing that is keeping him here. Your faith is keeping him here and you need to let him go. His mother told me some horrible stories about people who had kept loved ones with their faith long after the time that they should have died and the horrible death that they had. And, oh. and, um, and we did. We had some hard feelings about it mm -hmm. because I, I could not let go of that idea that I had that that was all that was required. Mm -hmm. And so when he did, in fact, die, I was left really confused about what faith was, about why we had not received the miracle. Right. Because I had tried so hard mm -hmm. to be unwavering. Mm -hmm. I, at times I wondered if it was because I wasn't worthy. Right. And those were the really lowest times. Yeah. Um, so I was left with a, with a lot of confusion. And it took a lot of time for me to be able to start to understand what that faith actually should have been. I... Um, I went back to school almost immediately because I didn't know what else to do with myself. Uh -huh. And in the mornings, I would wake up with the tips of my finger and my nose numb. I think I was just so shocky. Hmm. Um, and it to just be able to get out of bed, it took hearing that baby boy in the next room crying for hmm. me to just be able to get up and function. But, and, and then something happened that kind of turned that around. What was that? I started just having massive bruising. And I had always been kind of a bruiser, an easy bruiser, but all of a sudden I was just covered in bruises. Mm. And so I went to this hematologist that my husband mm -hmm. had gone to. He was a real cut and dry guy. <laughs> <laughs> and the minute he saw me, he said... Well, I think we're going to be testing you for leukemia. Oh, gee. And I thought, how could, th how could this be? Mm -hmm. But when I went home that day, there was a little glimmer of hope in me that that might be true and that I might be able to join my husband. Mm -hmm. That this terrible loneliness might be over. Right. But as I tried to sleep that night, and I thought about that little boy, mm -hmm. I started to desire to live, and to really live, to not just suffer through this, but to make a life for him and be a family. And I think that came much quicker because of that. Mm -hmm. um, then if if that thing hadn't happened as as it was um you know i was diagnosed with a much milder non-threatening condition mm -hmm. and uh and that passed but it it was a real blessing mm -hmm. to have to face that and really make up my mind that you were gonna fight and live i was gonna fight and live yeah that that was a good thing Oh, well, that's one way to see. <laughs> that's a silver lining <laughs> on a very stormy cloud. It was. Oh, it, it was. Another thing happened um, that really helped me uh, start to develop the kind of faith in God that I should have had. I think I was too immature in my faith before. Mm -hmm. um, I may have looked at that having faith 
uh, for you know prayers being answered. It's kind of a Make a Wish Foundation, mm. and I, an uncle of mine, mm-hmm. knew a, a wonderful woman, Stella Oaks, mm-hmm. and she, her husband had died and left died and left her with young sons to raise. Mm-hmm. And he said, would you like to talk to her? And I thought that it would be a great opportunity to hear from her how she'd been able to do that. She raised incredible sons. Mm-hmm. And when I went and talked to her, I told her how I felt that here my husband had been doing the Lord's work on the earth. Mm-hmm. And why wouldn't those prayers be answered? Why wouldn't God answer those prayers that people had given so that he could continue to do his work on the earth? Yeah. And some people had said to me, well, you know, he was needed on the other side. That's something that some people say. Mm-hmm. And I said, how could anything be more important than this wife and young son to raise mm-hmm. and she asked me if I'd asked God and I was kind of taken back um, up to that point in my life I had never approached God with questioning <laughs> uh, the outcome in my life or or um, questioning why he had answered a prayer one way or another. I'd never approached him displaying any kind of doubt. Uh Uh-huh. And I definitely had just been mostly a fair-weather friend. Mm. Where when I prayed, I approached him as I thought I should be. rather than how I was actually feeling or what I was actually experiencing. And she told me that I needed to go home and do that. And it was tremendously hard. But the minute I did, my relationship with him changed. And it was an instant that I understood Um, what that scripture in faith nothing wavering meant but over time I did gradually come to understand that it was faith in God and in his purposes that I should have faith, nothing wavering, that certainly ask him for what I want, but then have faith, nothing wavering in him doing what was best for me and what was best as far as his plan. And so I was really grateful I had talked to her and she had shown me that it was okay to approach God as myself instead of just someone that I thought would be acceptable to him. Yeah. I can only imagine how how hard, first of all, this experience must have been but then that whole idea of changing um, and I guess maybe venting to God, here's how I really feel about all this, that that would be a total change of thought if you'd never thought of doing that before. That would be extremely difficult, but probably almost liberating at the same time to say, here's how I really, really feel. Certainly, instead of... Um, always thinking I had to act a part to be acceptable to him. Um, It was certainly liberating because, of course, what happened immediately 
is I felt his love. And I think that I had that wrong notion that God loves us because we're good. And he just loves us because we're his. Mm. Good or bad. And doubting or full of faith. He just loves us. Mm -hmm. But if you always approach him um, how you think you ought to be acting or in a manner you think would make you lovable, then, then you really never have that chance yeah. to develop that intimacy, to receive that unconditional love that he has. That is a, an awesome perspective. And I think... I think it takes those hard times and us venting how we truly feel for us to really realize God's going to take us just as we are, <laughs> you know, look here, you're angry at me and you know, it's okay. It's okay. And I still love you, you know, and it's, it's reassuring to know that he's going to love us no matter what. And, uh, sometimes we wish we didn't have to go through these hard times to discover that, but I don't know how else we'd figure that out at the same time. <laughs> and I, I don't know how we'd develop the intimate relationship with him that we're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. We've all had fair weather friends mm -hmm. that are happy to chat with you as long as you act like everything's okay in the minute you go to share that something's not okay they're out mm -hmm. and you know that they're your friend but you know that they're not the kind of friend that you um, are closest to yeah and I am thankful that I can take my whole self as a sinner as a doubter as someone who's lonely um, my whole self to him as long as well as that person who is a believer mm -hmm. and is grateful and is faithful mm -hmm. and the, the whole me that, that is a much more intimate and rewarding relationship than that other ever was and I and your heart can heal with that. Yeah. It opens the door for healing and comfort. Because because he you're allowing yourself to kind of I guess it's like cracking open your heart to God and saying, Look, I'm totally bleeding out here. <laughs> Do you not care? Here I am, I'm suffering. And just that act of opening up to him allows his love to come in and begin, like you said, that process of healing. But we have to be vulnerable first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really hard. Yeah. Really, really hard. Yeah. And so, but so important. That's, that's an amazing lesson that she shared with you and that you learned because you acted on it. So that's a blessing. It's a blessing that you had the courage to open yourself up to God because it did help you begin that healing process. So here you are, you're still a young widow, and I'm sure that just because you had opened your heart up to God, all your questions weren't immediately answered. Is that a fair way of describing it? That's a very fair way of describing it. I continued to have that lingering question of why had not those prayers been answered? Mm -hmm. That he live. That he live. That, that this miracle be bestowed upon him so that he could be cured. The scriptures are full, full of stories of, of people being cured. And I knew people who had been cured from really, situ you know, diseases and things where there was no hope and they had received a cure. People talk about miracles happening in their lives and I just it didn't it did not affect my faith 
and God, but the question was always there. What happened? And how should I pray? Mm. And um, that went, it wasn't something that um, I focused on all the time or that I used as a, as a, a stumbling block to faith, but I certainly continued to wonder mm -hmm. why those prayers had not, why we had not received the miracle. Right. And the prayers weren't realized for healing. And then, nearly 30 years later, mm -hmm. I was attending a Sunday school class, mm -hmm. and a very humble teacher, not real charismatic, not real um, super educated, mm -hmm. just a humble disciple, mm -hmm. was teaching about miracles. Mm -hmm. And he shared his own father's experience of having cancer mm -hmm. and prayers being offered up for a miracle. And then he testified that those prayers were answered in his father's death when he was finally released from that terrible disease. Hmm. And I felt a sensation on the back of my head. And the very strong witness from the Spirit that this was the answer to what I had been wondering. And then it made perfect sense to me Yes, sometimes death is a cure. Hmm. And all those prayers by all those righteous people had been answered. It's just that we need to be more flexible in our thinking on how miracles happen. That is a really interesting way of thinking about that. And I don't know that I'd fully comprehended that either. That's a really good way that sometimes death is the miracle. Yes. And the other really nice part is that the Spirit will speak to us and let us know that, okay, what you're hearing, remember, this is the answer to that question. Yeah. Because I could have just been floating through that class, mm -hmm. that Sunday school class, and heard it and not... Um, gotten that message that this was the answer and so it was it was a wonderful thing for me and that was probably my first experience with the spirit telling me that mm. I've had that same experience since where the spirit has said this is the answer mm. but that was probably the first so I guess the lesson here is if you don't have all your questions answered, keep keep doing things that keep you close to God. Keep those prayers going. Keep attending church. Because you never know when the answer will come. No. It may be two years from now, and it may be 30 years from now that you finally right. go, oh, I get it now. <laughs> you know? Right. But uh, the answers will come. We just have to be patient. And... Uh, be open to the spirit. Yeah. Be in a open. situation to be open to the spirit, so yeah. that it can speak to us, and we can hear. Yeah, that peace that he promised to send, and he, it did come. That is incredible. Um, if you could go back and talk to your younger self, um, is there any advice that you would? give to that grieving widow with that little baby? Well, certainly at that age, I, you know, I quickly, with that experience, with that bruising, I quickly um, decided that I was going to live. I can remember one of the, when I was thinking, all right, what am I going to do just to demonstrate that I am living um, was to always have cookies in a cookie jar. <laughs> hey, if it takes cookies, that's great. <laughs> because in my mind, that seemed to be something that a family had. And I, I worked very hard to use that language with, with my little boy, Justin, 
so that right from the get-go that he would refer to us as a family and not a broken family mm -hmm. um, or part of a family. Uh, so I would, I would advise people to, as soon as they can, to make plans to pick those things that they think would make them feel whole and to do those things, even something as little as, I'm going to have cookies for you, even <laughs> if I don't have a husband to eat them. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have cookies for you. Um, and I would certainly try to teach that younger self about that, about what faith is. Mm -hmm. Because if I had had a more mature faith in God, I don't think I'd have felt as bewildered or been open to doubting myself and my worthiness for a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how at those low points of our life that the adversary is more than happy to take advantage and throw everything he's got at us, you know, especially at times those planting those seeds of doubt yep that you're not worthy and God doesn't love you or something like that when in fact the complete opposite is true that um, like you commented before we're lovable just as we are <laughs> he loves us whether we're perfect or not and actually none of us are perfect so he loves us imperfect and broken as we are because we're his sons and daughters so uh, maybe just an acknowledgement of the fact that when you're down and those negative thoughts come, remember that God loves you. God does not give us those kinds of thoughts. Yeah, no, he does not. Yeah. And that as we open up to him, we can feel that love. And that doubt will flee away, right? Because you know that you're a son or a daughter of God and that he loves you in spite of the hard things that are happening to you and around you, that you are loved. And that's probably one of the most powerful lessons we can learn in this life is that we are loved. So. Uh, you know, I thought that it, uh, you know, it turned out to be just such a great idea for me to talk to someone who had been through a similar trial yeah. to find out what they had done and um, I would really recommend that to anyone else too who was we often get a lot of advice from people who feel like they've been in a similar trial or feel like or even if they haven't in any way shape or form had the same kind of trial that you have they think that they know how you ought to feel <laughs> But, you know, but to reach out and to, um, for, for someone that I think that, I think that that would be good. I'd also want to, I don't know how you convince someone that time is a healer. Yeah. It's, it is commonly said. Yeah. But it is the truth that, um, that grief and loneliness does not remain as raw. That it does get better. And on the other hand, I would warn them that sometimes out of the blue, it will come back just as intense as it was initially. Really? Yes, but that that will then also go away mm -hmm. and... Not to be frightened by those, that that, that that intensity and that grief is going to stay for a long time. Usually it's not. It's like a day. Mm -hmm. and, and that then things will feel better and hope and, you know, a hope in the future and, yeah. and gratitude to really hang on to gratitude for what you have and not focus on what you have lost 
That is a really wise saying. Be grateful for what you have and don't focus on what you've lost. Yeah, that is a really good way of looking at it. So you went on and you remarried and you have many children now and now grandchildren. <laughs> How many grandchildren? Well, this weekend we will have our 29th. 29th grandchildren. <laughs> so the point is keep going. Live life. Put your cookies in the cookie jar. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, that um, fake it till you make it. <laughs> is there truth to that saying? There is truth to that saying. <laughs> of getting up and acting happy and certainly allowing yourself to feel your feelings but but uh, making cookies whether you feel like eating cookies or making cookies um, I took this baby boy camping I did the things that I had wanted to do as a family mm -hmm. and and it was very helpful yeah so maybe keep hold of the goals that you still can do yep yeah yeah. And and keep trying to live life the way that you wanted to live life. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're not married, um sometimes that can become a waiting game. And waiting is there is nobody in the world that enjoys waiting whether it's in yeah. a doctor's office or a DMV line. <laughs> <laughs> and waiting to marry or to find another relationship or to feel more complete is a waste of time just like those other things are a waste of time and so um serving other people coming up with a plan living your family life the way that you wanted to be a family all those things just help tremendously yeah. so fill your time then with good yep yeah with good things and and that and the happiness comes you know that being able to laugh again comes um being able to look forward to another day comes mm-hmm and then, when you've learned that with one trial, you've got that in your tool chest. chest. When trials fo follow, mm. you know, many many years later, I had another time of uh, trial where I doubted myself again. Doubted God, actually. Mm. I'd gone back to school uh, when I was thirty-nine to complete my degree. Mm -hmm in teaching and two incidences happened within six months and both nearly took the lives of two, da two daughters oh, wow. the first one was our youngest daughter um, a big diesel was parked on the street that shouldn't have been parked on and our cat ran across the road and she stood and looked both ways but because of that big diesel tractor that was parked there she ran straight out in front of a car and was hit and it looked very much like she would die mm -hmm. she she didn't but it was a terrifying time mm -hmm. and it took uh, quite a bit of time for her to recover uh, being able to speak with a full voice her sense of balance um, several other things. We just really did not know what we were going to end up with right. uh, from this little youngest daughter. And just when we were pulling out from some of that and things were returning a little bit more normal, mm -hmm. um, my second oldest daughter and I became sick with a flu. That's what I thought. It was a flu. And it was one of those that just grabbed your ankles and pulled and you just ended up out in bed for about three days mm -hmm. only I woke up and Megan didn't mm. and just continued to sleep and sleep and sleep 
And I would set the timer for 15 minutes that she had to sit up to the table and she would just sleep with her head on the table. I took her to doctors and she slept through examinations. And wow. it was very, very hard getting a diagnosis on her. And this whole time I'm in school full time okay. with seven children at home. <laughs> <laughs> And one day I was driving to school and I thought, why is the Lord withholding blessings from us? Mm. And very loud and clear in my mind, mm -hmm. the answer came that this had been a year of the greatest blessings we'd ever had. And I instantly understood that voice because both girls could have died. Mm -hmm. When, in fact, both girls did recover. But again, I was asking the wrong question. What was the right question? The right question was, help me see your hand in my life and help me to feel grateful during this time. Mm. And then maybe I would have been able to come to that thought without having to slip into further and further and further despair till I wondered, where is God in my life right now? Does he, does he, is he watching over our family? Mm -hmm. Wow. That. <laughs> and that taught me a huge lesson so that ever since then I have prayed to see the blessings in my life because I felt so so ashamed, so contrite for thinking the opposite thing of God than what was happening. Right. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. And that, sometimes, sometimes it's easier to see those hard things. <laughs> and we have to maybe look a little deeper to find the blessings. And so that's the, that's where that prayer would come in hand, you know, help me to see the blessings. Help me to see your hand. Yes, help me to see your hand. And to feel your love for me and for my family. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's one of those lessons that probably only comes through experience, right? <laughs> we wish we could learn it another way. <laughs> I'm sure that there are some lessons that only come through experience. <laughs> oh, man. It's true. It's true. My goodness. Um, are there any final bits of advice that you would like to share with and for people that are going through a hard time right now? You've shared some incredible very poignant experiences so far about learning to ask the right questions when you're praying and um, opening your heart to God. But is there any other things that you've found through your life that have been helpful as you've probably passed through more trials? <laughs> yep. Passed through more trials, that because that is this mortal experience, right? Yeah. Blessings and trials. Blessings and trials, yes. just to turn to God. Um, you know, there is a saying that people will say when you're in a hard time, you know, that God will never try you more than you are capable of bearing. He'll mm -hmm. never give you anything more than, than you're capable of bearing. And the truth of it is, any trial is more than we're capable of bearing unless we turn to Him. And so that would be my advice turn to him so that he can bless you and so the miracles can come and so his hand can be made plain to you and you can see his love yeah that is true I, I found that exact same experience to be true in my own life that uh, he often gives me more than I can handle and and <laughs> and it is learning and it is part of becoming stronger, but you become stronger with his help. I think when we try to handle it on our own, that's when we break down and feel completely inadequate because we are. Uh, life is hard 
and the challenges that we face are very, very difficult. And so it is learning to rely on God's strength. So I, I'm in complete agreement there. Rely on his strength so that we can be strong enough to get through it. And learn what we need to learn. Yeah. I mean, there's no point having to learn over and over and over again. And so that is another prayer is to during a trial is to help me learn what I need to learn so we can be done with it. <laughs> <laughs> so we can be done with it. It's like it's like give me the you know, it's like taking getting stronger in the gym. I mean, you only gain strength by suffering through all that weight training, right? Yeah. Well, we don't need to suffer without getting the additional strength. Mm -hmm. But you can <laughs> if you don't learn from the suffering. Yeah. It can just be suffering. Yeah. You know, it can just be a hard trial. But if, if we learn from the trial, then we gain strength in our relationship with God and in our own capability. So, yeah. Yeah. And we, we grow more confident that with God's help, we can do all things. Yep. Yeah. And that's a good place to get to. And of course, once you get to that place, you probably get hit with another trial. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, here we go again. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, this has been so helpful. And thank you for being willing to open your heart and share your experiences. Well, thank, thank you today. for asking. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time, and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode you forget. What were those great things? So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help bear that burden. Above all else, remember God loves you.